Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Francis. I'm the public art coordinator at City of Shoreline. And tonight we have a special presentation um, joined by a couple of guests. And uh, as you know, we are very excited to participate in Refract, the Seattle Glass Experience again this year. And as part of that, we have an event in Cafe Aroma in the Ridgecrest neighborhood. Rhea Friday is here. She's going to be joined by Tim Charles and Alex Kane on Saturday, October 16th from 1 to 7. And to my left here on the screen is Jody Nelson. She's our project manager working uh, on the project. It's been a, a, an all year project. It's taken many, many months and we're getting very close. So excited to have everyone join us tonight to talk about how do you design a glass object? So uh, thank you for the ideas that have come in already. We're getting a few and hopefully we'll get a bunch more tonight. Um, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jody to say a few words of uh, more introduction and then uh, we'll keep having our conversation going tonight. So thank you both for being here and thank you audience. Hi everyone. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Again, I'm Jody Nelson and I've uh, been hired to help be the project manager on this project. And throughout my experience, I've been in the studio glass movement for over 20 years. And as we get started learning a little bit more about what the studio glass is and how important it is, in the Pacific Northwest as we learn about how to design glass and what it's going to mean to be part of the shoreline arts and culture um, legacy. I think it'd be really fantastic to take a moment if all of us could get together and take a moment of silence and do a land acknowledgement. I like to acknowledge those people who've been taking care of the land well before me and who will be continuing to take care of the, the land long after me and all of us here together. So if we could just take a deep breath in and give thanks, I'd be most appreciative. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jody. Um, Segwaying back to um, our, our salon tonight, um, we put out a, a call for Shoreline residents and staff to submit ideas for the glass blowing event coming up. And um, we'd like to talk a little bit more about them. Uh, we have ideas. We um, gave a, a deadline of uh, December of October 5, and we asked for clear glass, transparent preferred, one to three colors, um, understanding that modifications are probably very likely to execute the object in our limited time. Um, and Rhea will talk a little bit more about that, I imagine. Um, so we're interested in the slides that are coming up and how the, how you approach the idea of making an object, given that um, I guess the the uh, the uh, furnace has certain dimensions, and they the objects have to go from after they're made, uh, they must cool slowly. So that's that happens in an annealer. So and any other preliminary comments, I'll turn it over to Jody and she'll show us some, some of these, um, these objects that have been made and some examples there. Jody? Um, can you say that you want to, us to show examples of what's been made? In my slide presentation here, I um, have put together kind of what it is that the Studio Glass movement is. Here, it's a movement that started throughout glass history in the 60s, how important it is here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Dave's gonna talk a little bit more about how to be um, part of the creative e economy, both in shoreline and in general for yourself. And then we're gonna go over some, some more of those guidelines about how to submit. And Ray is gonna be able to give more, um, more descriptions if needed on those size limitations why we've kind of put some color restrictions to one to maybe three colors at the most, um, and really just really dive into your imagination to help design what you think would be great part of the public art collection. So Rebecca, if you are able to join us, did you have any real specific questions that you had regarding a drawing or something, an idea or a concept that you've been thinking about with you being able to join us here and maybe give us some feedback. 
we can really talk to what you're thinking about specifically. All right, so Rebecca's not gonna be able to talk to us here in person, but David, did you wanna review that first slide at all? Uh, it looks like Rebecca has unmuted. Oh, good. Hey, Rebecca. I, I can't, yeah, sorry, I'm on my phone too. So, um, no, I'm more curious about like the process and um, I just found out about this meeting, I don't know, a few minutes ago. So I thought I would just like check it out. So that's right all. On. Right on, perfect. And are you a resident of Shoreline? Yes, yes, I live in Ridgecrest and um, I do pottery, so. Oh, you do? Cool, mm -hmm. cool, cool, cool. Do you know any other glass artists that live in your neighborhood? I don't. Okay, yeah, you have a number of them. Cool. Friends of Glass, they do a big tour. Um, yeah, so the Studio Glass Movement is important here in the Northwest. Have you have you heard about the Studio Glass Movement at all? Yes. Oh, right on. Perfect. Perfect. So this festival is kind of a, a nice blend of the Studio Glass Movement and some other artistic innovations that are happening in our area. And David here is the uh, public art curator and he's putting together a toolkit for residents of, of Shoreline on how to join this creative economy. So we're super stoked that you're here as someone that's already part of that creative economy. We'll dive straight, say that again, Dave. Yeah, ceramics and glass have a lot in common. And I think Rhea also was, uh, her first love was ceramics. I think some of her biographies say, and then she later on got attracted to glass. But you know, both of those meet, those um, materials lend themselves really well to making functional objects. So that means cups and bowls, everyday things that you use. And there's a real sort of applied aspect to those art forms. Um, that's very interesting. And they share a lot in common that way. Um, painting is not so practical. Um, its purpose is to provide beauty or a, a moment of peace or make you think, um, but uh, it doesn't have that sort of functionality that uh, a lot of glass and ceramic objects do. And the, the, the debate over craft versus fine art is continuous in glass and it rages on. And I think that if we get too stuck on that, then we kind of lose opportunities to do things that are fun that have never been done before because there's definitely places where functionality turns into art. We see that in museums all the time with yeah. what they create and, and how we historically look at things that um, you know, craft and fine art are constantly blending back and forth. Um, yeah, so I think that it's, it's, uh, it's, we should just let our uh, creative brains go wherever we want and then let everyone else pick up the pieces where, they, you know, and <laughs> they want to. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know, uh, is Rebecca a citizen who's just come into this meeting out of curiosity? Is there any kind of uh, logistical information that I can give to Rebecca about the uh, event or about how the glass is gonna be made or the demo itself? Uh, so I'm curious, I and one of the uh, examples is that uh, what I read was it mentioned a couple colors. It mentioned blue and green, which is like, you know, the shoreline colors primarily. So. I wasn't sure if it was like uh, this is an example or these are the two colors that we're going to work with. Example, so. um, you know, if you're familiar with glazes, the chemicals that create uh, color in glaze is the same as the chemicals that create um, colors in glass. It's just the, the, the body, the vehicle that you're putting those elements in that change. So, uh, you know, there are definitely a few places where even the stuff that's used for ceramic crosses over into glass and you can use them the same. Okay, but so um, for the design, it isn't like um, the example is not just like, no, these are the two colors that, that no, we want you to incorporate in your design. Because I wasn't, I mean, I assumed that wasn't the case, but I thought since you, all are very nice and have asked me to participate and ask me a question. I thought, well, why not ask this one? So there you yeah, go. Sure. It's a good yeah. one. It's a good one. 
Yeah. We have, we have enough time. We can really get our hands to, on just about any color. The limitations aren't so much color necessarily. It's more like, uh, you know, the, the equipment and the time that we have. Are you looking? Are you looking for a certain like dimension, size? I'm sorry. Um, dimension is is important. Uh, the equipment that we have, the opening that we're able to reheat the object in, is only so big. And then more importantly, is the object that we're cooling the piece down in, because uh, you know, in some ways, glass and and ceramics are similar in that they need to cool a certain way in order for them to be stable, and uh, that is called the annealer. And it is, I think it's got a 12 by three foot footprint. So 12 inches tall, three feet uh, at the diagonal. Um, so, and we're gonna be loading into that for seven hours, meaning that everything that we make that day that we want to save needs to go into that box and cool down over a period of time, including that piece. So, you know, you would wanna stick a design in there that is somewhere around, you know, 12 by 12, I'd say to leave enough space for another object. Okay. That's pretty good size. I think so, especially when you have it on the end of a stick and it's 2000 degrees. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you're working it with tools and scissors and pulling it and stretching it. Yeah. yeah. And logi logistically, if I could just make sure that all the questions were answered about the color. We are not necessarily limiting to a blue or a green color, but we are limiting how many colors. So okay. something 10 colors is, is, is a no-go because Rhea and her team are going to have to be able to finish, start and finish this within an approximate time frame. So we had suggested, and Rhea pop in here for sure, we had suggested something like transparent glass with one or two additional colors. So something like three colors could probably fulfill the design and the time requirements. Uh, and I, think, right. I would maybe up that a little bit more and then just let the people know who have submitted a design that will make discretions on the colors based on what the glass is even capable of doing and then what we can achieve in the time frame. So we're not really we can give people a little bit more creative freedom on the color zone, and then we'll just make a decision from there because there might be an object that is uh, submitted that's a perfect kind of design for what we have going on. It's fun, it's exciting, it's not overly complicated, but just complicated enough. And if it has one extra color, you know, we'll just let them know that we're gonna we're gonna kind of change it and 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 make them a little bit more simple. So I think that we could probably expand that three to more if that's possible. I don't know with the um, information that you guys have out there if that's possible at this point. Three colors is fine. We can do a ton with three colors. But if there's yeah. still time to open that up to the public to give them options, um, I'd say kind of let their imaginations run wild, and we'll come back in and say and we'll manage the expectations from there. And uh, I, would, I would love to share an example uh, at some point, it doesn't have to be now, but at some point I'd love to share anonymously the design that's been submitted. And because yeah. they, they included some they included some colors, it would be a good conversation and it, it might uh, lead us back into talking more about studio glass. It might lead us back into talking more about technique. Um, it might lead us on. So, so if I can try to bring it up on, on my screen, I'll try. Um, I think I've got it right here. So um, can you let me know if you see that? We do see that. Okay, great. So this is a salmon jumping out to uh, out and an orca whale candy dish. Um, so this is an example of, you know, a functional a sort of what we were talking about earlier before, which is kind of interesting is that when, when a functional object uh, approaches that uh, fine art aspect, like Rhea was talking about, uh, and, and you have a goblet here that, you know, you'd never really use for drinking your beer or whatever. Uh, it's an art object, um, and it, but it's, it's quite elaborate here. Can maybe, Rhea, can you share some thoughts about the, um, the colors and the, the, the shapes and the forms? Yeah, absolutely. Um... This is this is just my favorite thing to do in the world is take people idea, people's ideas and try to like make it out of glass. Um, yeah, I mean it it is possible 
the, anytime you get really delicate pieces of glass uh, and you're working with them on the pipe like that, it, they can be a danger zone in the sense that if it's thin, like thin, like a pencil, it wants to cool down. So, you know, it's much easier to make a pig than it is an octopus because the octopus <laughs> is so many of them, you know, or like a bug because those legs are so skinny and they just want to break. So any, you know, glass really wants to be a blob you know, just wants to be a blob, same way that water does. And so when the more you stretch that blob form away, you know, forms away from that blob, the uh, trickier it can be. But that's not to say that those things aren't possible. I would, uh, if I were to make modifications on this piece, I would make it a bowl, I'd add the orca, and I'd add a salmon, but I may not grit that, like, the salmon's trying to jump the orca or anything like that. <laughs> I would put them into the bowl, right? And it's, and it's an issue of functionality. Um, uh, I have a, I don't know if I have screen share capabilities, but. Yep, I, I can do that. You, you design it, uh, uh, image Google search for um, things that were made at the Corning Museum of Glass. And uh, Tacoma Glass Museum also does you design it, but they have uh, a very elaborate studio to do that. They have uh, multiple furnaces, garages, glory holes, you know, it's about, I think the biggest girl they have is like four feet wide in diameter. So it's huge. I mean, you can really do anything you want. And they have like a team of five people when they do this, but it's really fun. And I, and, and, and so what we're doing is the little um, uh, Baskin Robbins taster spoon version of this. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's my object right there. Oh, that's yeah. what I want. I want a little Baskin Robbins spoon. Oh. That's what that's what we're doing here. We're, we're making it But if we got share screen, yes. Let me let me stop this one, and then I should be able to. Yeah, you. I have capabilities. Let me share. Yeah. So here you go. Here's kind of how you see the things getting realized in glass. Um, some of them can be complicated like this. Like the they took the number of legs on this elephant tortoise giraffe something and made it smaller or this this tree chalice which i think is a great it's a great object or saturn so everything i mean it's fun and it's fanciful um but again when you're getting into really small delicate components people tend to shy away from that but it gives you an idea of, of the kind of fun interpretations that people can have in glass yeah, Barry, thank you so much for putting this up and just showing a whole whole a little gallery of, of thumbnails of, of what uh, people and kids especially have done. Museum of Glass Tacoma deserves um, a lot of credit for pioneering their, their kids design glass program when I was there. That was very popular. And I mean, it went over to Shanghai Museum of Glass. And um, so the, I love the idea of, of um, getting people excited about art and about glass by having them step into the the, uh, the role of the designer and the creator, co-creator. And um, it's really exciting to see an object that you imagined come into being. So, um, right. so here's like, you know, just where did that little, this is, a, I feel like a perfect like picture to, to object um, realization. Um, but it gives you just an idea of, you know, you can play around with a little bit more colors. It all depends on how we set up. Um, you know, the, the cup here wouldn't be that difficult, but this tiny little ladder with the marshmallows would probably be a challenge. So is that flame work? Is that lamp work or is that, uh, uh I don't think that this is, nope, no, nope, Chris Rochelle. I know Chris, he's a, he's a furnace worker. So this is all furnace worked. Ah. Um, I couldn't tell you if this is separately created and then added to it. It definitely is not added to it hot. It could be a complete, it's most likely a completely separate component. Um, but yeah, I mean, here's a little table of a whole bunch of stuff that was a you design it. And some of these things, if it's really simple, like a pumpkin, it can take 20 minutes. If it's more complicated, like a goblet of hot chocolate and marshmallows, it will probably take an hour and a half. <laughs> so it really depends. Uh, here's another way to realize a rainbow like some people just draw rainbows and they want you to do it and and it's on a vessel mm -hmm. to kind of give it some stability that's but, awesome yeah. 
right? Like that, a piece like this has multiple colors um, and this would probably take about a little less than an hour. So it really depends on how complex the object is, um, uh, whether or not it's, it's you know, gonna be a problem, whether it's gonna be feasible and all that. Another approach to, to the object is through the title that Jody created for the exhibit, the, um, the going back to the creative economy and, and, and you know, entering into it through art making, crafting, uh, being a creative person. Um, with with an object that um, um, I'm losing it here that um, uh, creative economy um, and crafting an object I, I need some help but uh, come back no, to me I think I'm kind of picking up what you're putting down so it's it's I guess it gets into that fine art versus craft conversation of you know there are the things that you make that enter into the economy because they're functional and people need them. Yeah. There's the stuff that you put on a pedestal and you put it on the wall and you love it and adore it. And then there are the things that you live with every day. And I think we're, you know, glass really hits that is an industry here in Seattle and, and yes. Seattle has yeah. some of the, the yeah. most robust uh, studio art uh, factory situation where it's not like a automated where it's actually individual artists who are making these objects. So you're talking like cups and ornaments. Um, yeah. Rhea, you... You did a lot of production work. It says production work. So what? What? Um, and and I, I got my thought. It was it was Jody's title for the exhibit inside Cafe Aroma. And that I want to I want to suggest that as a as a theme for for objects. But before I do that, I want to um, um, <laughs> let you finish. <laughs> oh no, I'm just I'm just kind of adding to what you're where you're coming at there, but. I don't, you know, I don't know what else has been submitted or what people are interested in. Um, you know, I've, these, these, uh, you design it things that we did in Corning, like we would have people submit them that day. You know, we'd have a bunch of crayons, kids would sit down and yeah, they would yeah. have something out and we would just pick it oh, out on the fly. Can we do that, by the way? Maybe we can do that in the cafe and, and, yeah, um, yeah. if there isn't enough submissions by the yeah, time the, yeah. the, um, the yeah. event rolls around. That's um, a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, we can we can make a call. And since Dan Studio is so close by, um, it's all the colors, <laughs> all the colors of glass that you can imagine are are not that far away either. So we can we can adapt on the fly. With Jody's title being connecting or connecting systems, uh, I thought that um, we the team um, that people might be able to create uh, objects based on that as a metaphor. So would that, how, how long does it take to blow a bubble about this big? And, and is it possible to connect one bubble to another to just sim symbolize the idea of, of the um, exhibit, which is sort of connect, and it goes back to the creative economy. Port of Seattle gave us funding for this event and as part of Refract, and it's a creative economy grant. And the, the city is interested in specifically in trying to help people of color enter into a creative economy that is where they use their imagination is 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 really what what is an asset rather than their labor their land or their capital so how do people in the future 21st century using their creativity and their imaginative cultural skills um, create these connections that's sort of the the bigger dream picture and so i i just see you know two bubbles sort of being connected uh, with a color as sort of something that could, so could represent that. So I'm hoping in our conversation here, we're about half an hour from the end game, but if we could talk about sort of, we, we've talked about figurative representation, a, an orca that looks like an orca, you know, that's literal representation. So if you see uh, an object like a baseball, you create something that looks very similar to the baseball, but there's another way to make objects. And that's sort of through abstraction and ideas and metaphors. So you, you try to create an idea and try to create an object that illustrates a concept. So um, I know it's all very fluffy up there, but I'm just trying to include a sort of abstraction to, yeah. the, to the figurative and the, and the functional that we're going to get. Because, you know, Harvey Littleton said, you know, people, yeah. technique is cheap and it's hard to come up with what to make. And I think I've seen a, having curated the Museum of Glass for a little while. Um, a lot of people as a glass artist are excellent at technique, but um, sometimes it can be hard to think of an object to make. 
And I've seen that not just in the Northwest, but also in China, same thing. Um, what do people make? If you become a glass artist, if you become a creative person, you're in the creative economy, what is the object that you are introducing to the marketplace to try to make a living at being creative? And that's well, an elusive, elusive question. But. I, I have an idea. Please. Okay. Yeah. So one of the concepts I, I've been playing around with is what unites us all and what do we all see? And yeah. that would be the moon. Yeah. Yeah. And when I look at the moon in Asian cultures, what they see and a lot of their myths are around are rabbits. So there's a rabbit in the moon. And we have so many bunnies in shoreline. <laughs> now, when I look at the moon I, and see the bunnies that are everywhere, uh, I, I tend to put those two together. And also, I, I, I kind of... Um, at a spot where people are are grieving so much of the loss of our trees here. So what, right. do we do, right. what do we do to, to make everybody also kind of like feel a oh. little bit better or bring us yes. together? Oh, that and is so then, great, Rebecca, yes. So if we could have like, I don't know, it could be a spear and that would be a really great chandelier and we could have like trees on it or we could just have, the silly little bunny or, uh, you know, but those are the objects and those are the things I was, have been thinking about, I don't know, in the past 10 minutes. So, you know. Wonderful, wonderful to hear. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> I yes, have the, to say, David, it's your fault, right? You started with. The, with <laughs> no, the, the metaphors are flowing. That's that's exactly what we're hoping this uh, salon is, is going to do. And, and, you know, salons back in the day, artists would get together and and brainstorm and, and uh, inspire each other. So um, it's just inspiring to hear your ideas and, and, and thank, thank you. you for sharing. Uh, you know, Shoreliners uh, in the park board meetings, the number one issue is trees and, and, and it's a tree city. Um, it's a city that prides itself on its nature and, and the trees are for, front and center of, of that, uh, of that um, value, you know, that aesthetic. So um, that would be a, a great topic, you know, to reflect an object that reflects the city as well you know it's there's some sort of specific intent there to match the object uh to something important to uh, uh, uh you know almost a culture or a, a group of people and that's uh that's good thinking you know um I, I also wanted to to mention that Rhea is down there at evergreen college in, in a native studies program she can give us the exact title um and and she's she and her brother have gone to the burke museum and looked at cultural objects and, and I've also seen uh, Chinese artists look at artifacts from their past and another one, and, and it's the same sort of thing. You look at your, your group or your community at objects that they value. What, do, what is the group, you know, how do they imagine things take shape? And, and there's sort of cultural knowledge embedded in, in functional objects that people use every day, manos, matadis, um, you know, these kinds of things are, are really rich to to uh, create as as objects in ceramics or in glass and and um, it, also in the creative economy right bringing it all back but Ray, Ray you I, teach if, at, my, at my alma mater what was that you teach at my al alma mater you teach oh, yeah. I, I'm a, I was a greener Still oh a greener. a greener pardon me when? Okay, uh, it was a long time ago, I'd say in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My, my aunt was the first woman uh, professor hired here. Wow. That's why I came. <laughs> really? Great. Yeah. Wow. She was the first female and the first indigenous professor hired at Evergreen State College. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. And she worked, worked until 82. So she was here for a while, but that's the program. I'm part of the program that she established. That's wow. Cool. That is so cool. That is. Yeah. And as a ceramicist, I feel like I have to tell you that I went to Alfred University and it's the uh, number one ceramic school 
uh, university in, in the United States. So it oh, was yeah. the, the ceramics kids and the glass kids hung out a lot together. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ben Moore also started as a ceramicist. They had just way, it, it was so much more robust, the ceramics program. It's like, we were the pirates and they were like civilization. They had, um, <laughs> they had a really cool uh, uh, the program where the artists got together with the engineers. And so the ceramic kids would design a clay body. They would just create a wish list of, I want my clay body to do this. And then the material scientists or the ceramic engineers would try to create it and they would play together. And the, the glass engineers, and the glass art kids didn't hang out that often. It was <laughs> you're too strange. We we're we we're a weird bunch, but uh, it was we, our departments were right next to each other. We're very messy. Lots of plaster. All just a very a very dirty crew. Yeah, got a, got a special place in my heart for the ceramicists. Thanks. And, and yeah. you finished yeah. at, at after Alfred. You you went. You were at the same time. You were at Corning Museum of Glass. You were at Tech. Yeah. You went into the Education Department. And then what? You know. So it sounded like you were in the creative economy in New York. You entered into the creative economy. You were going to school, but you were also working and, and doing glass. Um, um, so yeah. you were in. You know. You were in. You were part of the creative economy. But you wanted to come back to the glass mecca, the glass, your, your roots in the Northwest where your culture was. And uh, can you talk yeah. a little bit about why you left a, a su sort of successful creative economy on the East Coast and came back to this one? Yeah, um, I actually started working in glass before I went to school. I was 26 when I transferred. I had an associate's degree and, you know, I, I was raised by a single mom. I can't really complain about my childhood in the sense that I feel like I had everything that I needed, but I, we didn't have, we weren't very rich in money per se. So uh, I knew heading into, you know, even high school that uh, college, if that was going to happen, I had to be really smart about it. I had to plan about it and I was going to be, I was going to be paying for it myself. So um, I wanted to go to school for glass, but I absolutely did not want to learn how to work with glass in school. It's a very expensive class if you're learning how to just gather up a single bubble there. So uh, being in Seattle, which is the Mecca for glass in the United States, it seemed silly for me to go to a, some other state and some other school and pay tens of thousands of dollars to learn what I could get paid to learn here. So I worked in the creative economy in Seattle in glass uh, manufacturing for seven years before I left to go to, to Alfred. And that way I entered into the system there um, fully capable of making anything I could imagine. So my skill was not a limitation to my ideas. Wow. And I uh, stayed uh, in New York and in Corning. And I have to say that Corning is, um, I've never been to a company town before and, it, and not many <laughs> yeah. towns still exist. Factory town. It is, it yeah. is that. Yeah. It is a Fortune 500 company. That town exists for the company. They do um, amazing things there. I mean, fiber optic cables, catalytic yeah. engine convert. I mean, it just is all this stuff. But um, I left in 2008. So the economy did some crazy things in 2008. Ooh. And um, I also missed home. My whole family is out here. And um, my I have a nephew. And I just felt like, I don't know, I just was, it's hard, it's hard to be away. The Northwest is in my bones. And so... Uh, the fact that it's also where glass is, it was not that hard of a choice to come back. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I came back and I think it took a couple of years for the economy to get to a place where glass had recovered enough that it was still a viable thing and I started working on glass again. And then here we are. <laughs> and here we we'll are. be making a booklet as part of the project uh, on the creative economy titled Connecting Systems. It's kind of a toolkit. And we're excited. Raya will have a, a written piece and uh, we will be having the book, I think, at the event on uh, October 16th. We're in like a second or third draft. So we're excited to share that as well. Um, I don't want to I don't want to forget that, that Jody, do you have a couple more slides that you wanted to present or got about um, 20 minutes? I'll go back and go look. But I was just I'm I'll go back and look at my slides again. But just 
going back to our riffing together and brainstorming, you know, Rebecca had brought up um, the idea of trees. And Rebecca, can you kind of expand a little bit on that? Like, were you thinking trees in like a sculptural sense? Like, here's a trunk, and then here's some here's some leaves. Because we have Ray here, and with her experience, she might be able to help kind of interpret what your drawing would be with the trees now, and maybe help lend some thoughts to how you could draw it. If that's the idea you want to go forward with, because trees, you know, we you know. And there's different ways you could put a tree together in glass. We could get, you know, the different colors or the line work, you know, or a standalone type tree. Um, I'm kind of thinking about like um, what the shape would be. Like if we were talking like it was going to be a sphere like the moon, then it would have the images like of a bunny or what or or something else and i would draw a bunny but and have the trees come up from the bottom and then so they would be framing around the the bottom of of the sphere or they could um that's one idea the other Perfect. idea I have is yeah. for it to be flat and to so the, and to have it kind of this the piece itself to be almost a little bit jagged. So there would be trees, but also it, they would be mounted on so that it looks like, oh, the, there's some of the mountains, there's some of the Olympics. Because I'm from here. And so I'm from the the Olympic air, the Olympics area. And so that's what I you know living in Ridgecrest, that's what I get to see. And um, that's also my home. So I, and then having in the corner somehow uh, a moon. So that would be like more of a flat piece that would be, you know, that would have be three dimensional or it would be a sphere that would be literally the moon itself with this more and and when i think about the sphere itself i just i just made out of ceramics this, this piece of uh uh like that i'm making for my son a, a garden uh totem and what and one of those totems is uh this uh is the moon with the with the bunny in it Ooh. so it's really cool so yeah, so that's another reason why that's kind of like it's stuck in my brain. And and these bunnies are everywhere. <laughs> so yeah. Got um, coyotes eating them over here at Car Keek Park. Oh, but I know, I know. So, but we don't want to put we don't want a coyote in the moon, right? Because I, you know, <laughs> even though there we could, you know, tie that into <laughs> other thing, you know, people are not really happy with the coyotes right now. But but we like our bunnies, so you know, that's and it's that's culturally relevant for some cultures. So um, yeah. But the the so those are the two. The, I, so I don't know what what. That's why I was asking about dimensions and size. I don't know, you know, are we looking like, so basically before I would even draw anything up, I just need to know, is it more likely that you're interested in a sphere or are you more, you know, a, a round piece or are you, or is it more of a flat piece that would be three dimensional? Well, that that makes sense. Sense. <laughs> <laughs> not to put you on the spot here, Raya. Yeah. Well, she she's going to be the one holding the pipe and all the color. So yeah, let's see. Yeah, let's I mean, see what's going to be good for her. It it really can be anything. It can be something that's flat, and we make it there. It can be something that it, everything's done hot. There's a number of different ways to work with glass, and and furnace working and hot is just one way. In the same way that you know. You got to grind some of the um, of the of the glaze off of ceramic uh, when it's cold and it's done. There's finishing work like that with glass too. So I just pulled up some pictures of stuff that I make. Is one way to interpret the scenes that you're describing. Uh, it's part of it is made hot and then part of it is made cold. 
Um, so I can show you what that looks like. Let's see. I'm gonna have to share my whole screen with you for you to see this. Are you going to be etching at all with the glass or oh all my? So if you can see this on your screen, this is an etched piece. Um, it's got multiple colors layered in there. And then it, it's like a cameo. It's just uh, the image is um, preserved and then the rest is sandblasted away so that you can see the colors. And then the stars, and there is a moon in there uh, on the other side are ground from the inside. So the pattern is, it, the specific pattern that you see is created uh, cold. Here's a close up. That's so it's beautiful. The trees and the people, that's all black glass. And then there's a layer, multiple layers of clear glass. And then there's pink and blue and purple glass underneath. And then these stars are ground through that. Uh, here's another version of that, a different shape. Wow, um, So I haven't seen this before. You've seen, uh, you can see there's a, 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 the supposed to be representative of Puget Sound and the Olympics and the San Juans down here with the night sky. And then here's another picture of a different side of the same piece. So it's, it's, it is something that, you know, this could be made. It would definitely, I don't know if it would be very exciting to do in a, demo, a demonstration, but that is a possibility. Um, the other things, I pulled up some stuff because you were talking about um, you know, combining stuff. Rich Royal is the guy that I think of when you think of combining. He sticks things together hot often um, and does some really cool things that are interpretive and not so literal. Um, but when you're talking about you know, kind of more of an emotional feel or a thought experiment, uh, this is something that I feel like. Thank kind you, of he's, he's a perfect example, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, there's lots of different things. Um, you know, it's possible to take uh, even just a poem and turn it into glass, um, but it could be three-dimensional, it could be flat. So it, it really, there, there are limitations, but there are a lot of possibilities within those limitations. I don't know if that answered your question, but it could be round, you know, I mean, we could make a round moon and, and add some elements to it. And then we could sandblast trees on it. We could do um, a flat moon and a flat tree stuck together. That would be a wall piece. Yeah, we could it's helpful to think about how it's going to be displayed, whether it's a sculptural object on a pedestal or whether it's a wall mounted, more of a flat, you know, right. flatter piece. Yeah. Undoubtedly, anything that's made is going to have to have some cold working done on it because there's always going to be a sharp edge when you break it free. But other than that, yeah. Yeah. So, Rebecca, anything with this relief thing, you know, you could watch it being made um, during the demo. And then if it was sandblasted, you'd have to see the results after. Oh, gee, I hate when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> just, just in case, you know, you like the process part of the whole, the whole art making. Well, what might even make it more interesting would be to have the tree being holding on to the moon. So the top there would be the, the tree roots would be covering the moon with the images of, of the rabbit or or an image of, of something other than the tree. So it would look almost like a raindrop. Like a tree holding a raindrop. That's cool. So are you going to sketch some stuff out? Oh, yeah. But OK, so uh, <laughs> my drawing skills, you're going to get what I have, which isn't like, you know, I mean, yeah. That's awesome, though. That's great. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. I don't, are, I, do you have a ticket so that you'll be able to come and, and watch Freya and the art team blowing the, the objects? I do, thank you. I oh, have great. a friend who invited me and I'm gonna go with her. So thank well, you. Wonderful, yeah. Yeah, yeah so these, these drawings are due October 5th and I feel like we need to give you that email submission or do you have the paper submission? Which, which do you think you're gonna do? Um, probably uh, email, but I could do paper too. You know, I'll draw it out. So I don't know what's the easiest. Yeah, whatever, whatever's easiest for you. I think our, um, 
the, the upload, the entry is right here on the screen, the art entry at shorelinewa.gov. And at Cafe Aroma, we have some papers that are out too, maybe at the, at the library too, right? Like at, at Cafe Aroma, we have pieces of paper that you can draw on directly at there at the cafe and then put it yeah. submitted in the our art box that we have there. Yeah, you mentioned you're a Ridgecrest neighbor. That's one way to do it. It's um, Cafe Aroma's there at, a, I think it's 165th and 5th, something like that. Yes, I, I know that place. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, th that was really helpful, Jody. Just so we have about 10 minutes left. You know, if we could just sort of uh, think about, um, you know, deadlines, submissions, ticketing, information, and help people with uh, where the information is. There is a Facebook event page. Uh, the Shoreline Public Art page is shorelinewa.gov slash art. And how many, how many drawings do we think we're going to, to select? I mean, I, are we going to play it a little bit? Is the jury going to play it a little bit by ear to well, see the, the, how many? We, we do get? have guidelines saying maximum four awards. So we okay. will be, we will be offering people a hundred dollars with the W9 and uh, for the, for the, any designs that we decide to pick as a team. Um, I'll be creating a file sharing site, Dropbox, and as soon as we get a couple more, as soon as Rebecca's comes in probably, or even before that, I'll start uh, sharing that folder through Dropbox so that you can see them after, as they're coming in and after October 5. But Rhea, you might want to make a decision. We might want to look at them. We can talk about it uh, a little bit later this week about setting a date for us to sit down as a team and look at what uh, shoreliners have imagined. So um, hopefully that they'll be coming in, you know, if, if not, that's okay too. I'd love to, um, I'm all about creating traditions and things like that. Uh, we had, Dan was amazing last year and we got to see Rhea too. We saw sister and brother last year. Dan had to take a um, um, once in a lifetime opportunity overseas to develop his career. So we wish Dan the best, but we love yeah. Rhea. Um, and so excited to be here future. in uh, 2021 together and doing it. So, um, you know, hopefully, sure, I would love that Shoreline supports Refract forever and, and supports our, our glass community. It's not, uh, you know, there's not every city, you know, has that sort of affinity for glass as a contemporary art in our region. But uh, with my background and Jody's background and uh, creative people at City Hall, we're hope hoping to become sort of a, a glass friendly city. And uh, we do have glass in the new public art piece by uh, Riza Architecture and Design out of Portland, Oregon. They have some bullseye glass in a large 14 foot tall by nine foot abstract shape down there at town center. Uh, give them a quick shout out, but um, other practical stuff. Yeah, Rebecca, do you feel like you're much more informed now? Yes, I, I appreciate you guys taking your your time i mean you know it's, it's kind of like very nice that you have um allowed me to talk so much and to um you know be so um yeah i, I want to thank you all for your kindness absolutely and we're so glad that you were able to really um connect with us and especially with with raya because she'll be i know right I know. i'm <laughs> Right on, thank you. It's much more fun when we can connect with actually with who is here. And Rhea, thank you so much for sharing your, your beautiful art. I appreciate it. And I'm glad you're teaching at Evergreen. Oh, thanks. It was wonderful to talk to you. Yeah, it was nice to talk to you. I will then see you all at some point probably. And I'm sure you have other things to talk about. So thank, I will be um, leaving. So. Thank you very much for, Thanks, uh, Rebecca. Thank you. for all your for your kindness. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. And we are sold out on a couple of the uh, hours for the event. Uh, just sold out the the first two slots, the uh, one o'clock to one forty five. I think they're timed for forty five minutes, and then whatever break it, the team needs. And then the first two slots are sold out, and I think there are three other slots. And there's like two tickets here, there. So 
uh, we're expecting, you know, 50 to 60 people over the, over the time period. It would be great to, um, to go as far as possible to 7 p.m., but understanding that the team will be tired and that if we need to start tearing down and just showing people tricks on the Marver with um, two-dimensional <laughs> glass, that's fine too. So, um, you know, whatever, however the day wants to go, um, we will be working on a schedule here so that one key thing I realize is that the parking is two hours, I think from eight until 6 p.m. And that means we would need, I would need to get there Friday afternoon and like safety cone out the three spots that we want to occupy and making sure that Alex's van has a spot as well because Friday night, Ridgecrest will be going, the theater will be going, those spots will be, you know, we would want those spots, I think, um, Friday night starting at five. So the earliest you could get there for the for for legal parking would be, I think, four o'clock on the Friday afternoon. Um, if we need to get there before that, let's safety cone those spots and talk to Ed about um, saving us some parking. So, cool. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. But thank it's all you. coming together. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you. What a, what a team. I'm excited. Um, it's been a long road this year. It's, it's been a lot longer than I thought. And, and uh, sometimes the path is like that. It is, it is not uh, paved. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Had some gravel. Well, I, I appreciated Rebecca um, maybe getting past her shyness and being able just to freestyle with us. I think that that is the best ever. I think it's the best to be able to connect, you know, and really hear what they're thinking about instead of just talking at them. Absolutely. Or did, Rebecca? or did she find you? She found us. Nice. Yep. She, she seemed to have found the, the, the event link to this salon specifically tonight. Yeah. Um, going with a friend to the event. So I'm yeah. hoping for a few more people, but, um, I, you know, it's, we'll, we'll be, rec we recorded it. It'll be available pretty soon here. I think it takes a little bit for, um, I think it has to go to YouTube. And then I use the link, something like that. Tavia Tan, communication specialist, the city will, will know which way to yeah. uh, send the, the, uh, and it was, it was part of the programming that we added to this whole thing on, a, you know, when Dave and I were just brainstorming what else we could do to, talk to citizens instead of just giving them a piece of paper because we know people are a little bit shy sometimes to give a drawing out there. So we wanted to really get more engagement. Andrea, thank you so much for the for the kids, you know, the, the design uh, oh, yeah, thumb, sure. thumbnails and, and your work was great to see. Box star status over there, yeah, Rhea. That second piece that you showed, is that is that in the, that that was a big tall shape. It looked like that, a giant missile or something or a, is rocket. That a bullet. It's a big bullet. I did a whole thing. My, um, it's just about reclamation. Wow. It's yeah, amazing. Can be, you can be, uh, have different meaning to you. The, one of the only things I own, own that was also my father's is a bullet that he right. brought back from Vietnam. And so it has such a different connotation in reality, but to me, it, it means something completely different. Yeah. And so I had a show of all these different bullet shapes and then and a little glass bell jar on a tiny little shelf. There was the bullet sealed so that people could see it. Ooh. Yeah. I, hey, can I ask, can we go over that, um, the timeline of events? You shared that document with me. It was like, yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page when it comes to timing. And Let me, um, I have that document. Let me, I'm just going to go, um, I went look at look away for a minute and I'm going to go to go find it so I can screen share it. I'm going to I'm going to pause us on recording so we can just go over the schedule if, you, if that's okay. Yeah, that that's great. Great.